This is Investing Insights with Barry Burnett. I'm your host, Barry Burnett, and we are in the middle of a great conversation with architect design guru, John Cambionica. John, in Southern California, there are architects and then there are architects. You started with a huge firm. You broke off and you put together a really spectacular small design firm, and you did that because you have closer access to the client yourself. Uh, yes, uh, our, myself and my, and my partner deal directly with the clients, and uh, together we have uh, about 50 years of expertise in wow. this business. So, um, Well, and John, when we were talking on break, there's the investor actually has to make money. They have to see a purpose and a reason for having invested in the first place. And when they get involved with outside vendors or other source materials or experts, they want to know it's going to bring something really important, really valuable to their bottom line. And you do that. You do that in spades. What is it that you do that brings extra value to the investors that are listening to us right now? Well, we we hope to, or we endeavor to uh, provide our investors, uh, clients, with uh, information that they can plug into their pro forma. Everybody's kind of working on the no-go, go go, uh, scenario uh, in terms of pulling the trigger and purchasing a property. And what we're we're, we're, uh, striving to do always is to help them find those numbers that that assist them in their pro pro performance. Whether it be a ground up project, in which case we're analyzing uh, the building size and, and, and balancing that with parking requirements. And at some point, and, and those are incremental studies that we do, and at some point uh, the developers will have uh, square footages, habitable square footages, the amount of parking, and they can start assigning uh, dollar amounts to those. And that allows them to find the most profitable size of building for that site. A lot of times the most profitable uh, building is not necessarily the the biggest building you can put on a site. Well, okay, let's talk about a specific example because you recently did a uh, rabbit out of a hat scenario for one of my clients on a, a particularly small property. Then you took a parking scenario and allowed the highest and best use to do about a hundred eighty-five thousand dollar value add from the previous use. Now that's pretty huge for a two thousand sixty-seven square foot building, wouldn't you agree? It is. It is. And so it, we were talking about pro forma. Why don't you explain how that really impacts a an investor? Well, every investor is looking at how does the property perform after everything is said and done, after either they're occupying the building or they're leasing the building, uh, and and where, where is this um, project financially going before they actually pull the trigger? So what we're uh, instrumental doing is getting, we can even get uh, where all their city fees are going before during that due diligence process before they even get into construction. For example, we just um, we finished a project uh, in a city where it went through a development review process, and it was, I, I want to say, about a 7,500-square-foot commercial building, mm-hmm. but the city fees for that size of building were upwards of $130,000. So it's always helpful for our investors to know that money up front uh, and if they weren't expecting it, wowie. Yes. And then we also try to work with city agencies, uh, you know, uh, in regards to what type of, uh, of uh, fire life safety issues are going to come up. and Which is like sprinklers and emergency exits and hatches and doorways and things like that. Mm-hmm. And, and for... Older buildings that don't have fire sprinklers in them currently, you're talking about bringing a whole fire service to that that building, and uh, it can get expensive. Well, that oh. might even include new plumbing for a, a certain uh, volume of, of hydrant as well as uh, offshoot sprinklers. It does. And um, 
And then there's there's also some latitude too in terms of, of assisting the fire marshal in ascertaining whether uh, fire sprinklers are required. We had a client that purchased a large property uh, that used to be manufacturing and uh, the previous tenant was a, a real famous steering wheel company. They manufactured these great crafted steering wheels for cars and this this industrial complex was going to be repositioned for, again, creative office space. Hmm. No fire sprinklers. The building was built probably somewhere in the 1940s. Yeah. Uh-huh. So we, uh, we went to the fire marshal and said, we, we know that your municipal code requires all buildings over 10,000 square feet to be fire sprinklered. However, in this particular case, we're going to be looking at going from a a hazardous type of tenant that has a manufacturing process with solvents and things that can catch fire to one that's relatively safe. And we have this unique location where the building has fire department access on three sides. Hmm. What do you think about the fire sprinkler system? And uh, we went back and forth. So you're, you're, you're thinking around the corner, something that the investor may never have even seen on the page. And so you've gotten in there and you're interfacing in something that is going to save them tons and tons of money as, as well as a lot of time and, and arguments. That too. So we're, we're basically there trying to just uh, identify potential costs. In this particular case, the fire marshal was uh, – a person had been around a long time. He looked at the project objectively and said, you know what? I see your points. We're not going to require fire sprinklers on this one project. Victory. So, you know, it. In, in sometimes an attempt to, to, to identify costs, we can also uh, head off some of those costs. So you weren't circumventing anything. You were just making it more obvious and clarifying it so that a, a better decision could be reached. Absolutely. And it saved the client a lot of money, right? Yes, it did. That's got to feel good at the end of the day. It does. It does. Um, same project. We uh, also had a portion of the building that had uh, mezzanines, which are second interior, second level, uh, with staircases. Uh-huh. And um, initially, we believed that those staircases uh, would have to be uh, supplemented with an elevator to get ADA access to the mezzanine. How did you deal with that one? We, uh, we worked with the local building department and found that through ADA, there's, there's some latitude in terms of equal facilitation so that in the case where you have a same tenant occupying the ground floor as the mezzanine and they provide equal facilitation, in other words, what's on the upper level is duplicated on the, on the lower level, there's no need for access to that upper level. So in that particular case, our client didn't have to add an elevator. What an important um, distinction. What an important way of, of understanding and interpreting so that your client, the, the entrepreneurial investor, wins all the way across the board because the ADA is a really huge, really scary monolithic thought that smacks a lot of int- entrepreneurial investors right between the eyes. What a great solution. Well, we're in the process of talking with John Cambionica, the design architect chief of CBA Architects, and you can reach John through barryburnett.net. That's barryburnett.net. John is uh, a, a, an architect that will save you money and expedite your process, and I, I really feel a tremendous amount of confidence in this content. What he's telling you works. It's worked for me, and it's working for my clients. I'm delighted that he's here on the show with us. We are in the process of talking about how to save entrepreneurial investors' minds, their wits, their their emotions, making you and your portfolio stronger, safer, smarter. I'm Barry Burnett. We'll see you next week or see us on YouTube or podcast. Thank you for joining us.